sent him another link. We're recording right now. Um, so we'll give it a few minutes and see if any of the links work for him. Let's really hope that it works because we have a lot to get through. <laughs> Michelle, can you hold on just one second? Mm -hmm. All right. Hey. All right, guys. And how'd you end up getting in? Uh, I honestly don't know. I was about to reboot the whole thing, and then I just got a pop up that said, "Would you like to join as a panelist?" And I would, yes. <laughs> so we have no idea how Ooh. to. <laughs> that was lucky. Boy, I was starting to lose hope that we were gonna make that work the same thing happened to dave zomek the other day by the way Leroy. so uh, i think that there's something like a fluke or something going on with um <clears throat> zoom i was just about ready to uh, blame it on Maya for sure but if it's a known problem with zoom i feel a little better but let's jump right in i guess it's a little uh, real behind <laughs> okay sounds good um so um what I did was I started with an empty shell, basically sort of starting from scratch. And the reason I did that was because I need to go section by section, subsection by subsection, and seeing what's, um, what the old regulations look like, what the Wetland Protection Act looks like. In some cases, in most cases, what I did was for sections like performance standards, which performance standards are really important. The performance standards from a regulatory standpoint are what people have to meet when they file a permit. And so those I copied over from the Wetland Protection Act. And then I looked at our old version of the regulations and the ones, the sections, the subsections of um, the performance standards that were different, I copied in. So, so we're consistent now in the sections that I've edited with the Wetland Protection Act, but we still have in those performance standards that were additional from our bylaw. Did anything sub substant substantively really change? Um, the pieces, so remember we had talked about this before that um, it, it was almost as if the Wetland Protection Act had been copied and pasted into our bylaw, except there was things that were taken out, things that were added into some sections, and it was really confusing and inconsistent what, what was the same and what was different. Now it is consistent, except where there's additional required performance standards, those are added in as additional. So I'm trying to make this as um, clean as possible. So for bank, um, I'm, I still haven't gotten to the preamble for bank yet. Come back to that, okay? We'll revisit that hopefully at the next session. <laughs> Definitions of bank are the same as the Wetland Protection Act. They have not changed from the existing bylaw regulations. So I'm just gonna move through this. And I have these highlighted so that you guys can see what's changed and what has not. Um, presumptions are the same as the Wetland Protection Act, same as previous bylaw, except where this language was adjusted. So previously, um, the way that this was written was not very, um, from a regulatory standpoint, it wasn't really tight. It was basically saying, something to the effect of land within 100 feet of bank and 100 feet in riverfront and are likely to be significant. And that 
is not a good way to write it because we really have to be clear bank of an intermittent stream and land within 200 feet of a bank of a perennial stream and then I put riverfront area to be clear. So that was like a clarification that I did there to make sure we're talking about um, what we're talking about lines up from a regulatory standpoint. Um, the, this, um, the general performance standards were made consistent with the Wetland Protection Act here under bank, which there wasn't much of a distinction there, to be honest. Now, there's going to have to be some editing here as far as the references back to the Wetland Protection Act. So bear with me. This is going to have to be looked over by town council. We're going to have to make sure we're referring to the correct sections. Um, but this is mostly just to give you a sense of the shell of this. Um, these are the additional ones, uh, the additional performance standards associated with the existing regulations. So you can see this is a good example section where it's like the top is Wetland Protection Act performance standards and then the bottom two are the town performance standards. Um, so I'm not sure what would be the easiest way to talk about this. Um, this is, is really, you know, reading this, these in detail is really interesting. Like this is a good example. They're saying here basically that within 50 feet of the bank, no activity can take place. Um, now, I'll just talk, let's just talk this through for a second because in the, in our, this, the, remember how I told you guys before that our bylaw sort of conflicted with itself in many, many places? This is an example. Remember that little table that says people can put a, they, there can be dis disturbance up to 35 feet and that single family homes could be built within 50 feet. So that's inconsistent with this. Um, because this says no work can happen within 50 feet. Very important to keep that in mind, um, except as approved on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> no structure of any kind shall be permitted on an eroding bank to protect a building or other structure to a permit have a granted. Note to mention that, like to call that out with the table specifically, because I... I imagine the table will be the most referenced source for this. So this yeah, might get we're going to come back to the table, Michelle. Stay with me on that, um, because I made the table 50 feet all the way down the board um, okay. as far as no work within 50 feet. And that might be controversial, So, um, but that's what I did. So we can edit that or change that, but that's just what I did to make it all consistent. Um, there was also a note in here about if you want to be closer than 50 feet, you file for a variance. The variance section we took out because it refers back to zoning. And this is really interesting because like Leroy on the last hearing that we were talking about, we were talking about building envelopes and the, the applicant was like, no, the building envelope is determined by zoning. He, that, is not, that is not correct at all. There's a building envelope that zoning defines, and that's for meeting zoning setbacks. For conservation, the building envelope is completely different. So you were 100% you were correct, Leroy. He was not correct. Um, but anyway, uh, we don't want references to zoning in here or anything that resembles zoning. So we can come back to this. I just wanna give you guys a little overview of this and then we can, we can discuss. Um, so bordering vegetated wetland, the preamble here, you'll see I did the preamble for this and I did the preamble for isolated vegetated wetlands, which I changed from seasonal wetlands to iso isolated vegetated wetlands to make it consistent with the Wetland Protection Act in terms of how we refer to the resource areas. What I did here was, you can see the list. I'm just gonna scroll back up really quick so you can see this. You can see the list. These are under our local bylaw. These, these values right here are the values that our bylaw 
protects. There's eight interests under the Wetland Protection Act, seven inland interests, and we have more than what the state has. Um, I think we have 12 or 13 here. So what I did was with our preamble, and the preamble in the Wetland Protection Act is a couple paragraphs, and it usually talks about, um, you know, how each resource area is um, presumed to be significant to the interests. What I did was I put the interest at the top and then I made a list um, of what the resource area was presumed to be um, significant to as far as um, that specific interest. So I made this section quite a bit longer and I did that because I feel like this is a very important section and that we if if we're going to say that these are our interests and that these are the resource areas that we protect, I think we should be really specific about what how that resource area serves those interests according to our bylaw. Um, so I, I broke those down, and this was based on research that I did, which is in your um, that I uploaded to the OneDrive, then that like research folder. Um, I make a comment on it when you're please do yeah um just up to b i uh no sorry previous section okay oh the um, numbering is off there i'm glad you pointed that out so, so the first b yeah i know i these should be in order though so i've got to fix that okay Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. You call out vertebrates, but I'm imagining like monarchs and dragonflies, which migrate and breed in bordering vegetated wetland. Is there a reason why you're calling out vertebrates and not both vertebrates and invertebrates? Nope. I um did I spell it wrong? Yeah, remove the okay. comma, remove the comma after vertebrates, and then it looks. What'd you say? The comma after vertebrates can be removed. There you go. Yep, yep, that was a good catch. Please, anything you see like that, I mean, this was taken from research that I did, so a lot of this was like me really hustling, trying to put this together. So if anybody has any suggestions for things that will um salmon bearing maybe you mean salmonids like i think trout is a salmonid but it's um i don't know it's so d so it, salmon's generally oh wait it is salmonid no i just changed it okay. i just changed it <laughs> <laughs> i just edited it for you i think that makes sense <laughs> Sorry, Leroy, what did you say? You're very quick. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, just going to keep scrolling. Stop me at any point. Uh, I have a couple of comments before. I, yeah. Please. Yep. Uh, I like, we had, now the weathering's different, so I'm having trouble tracking, but we had one on biochemical cycling. I really like that. Um, we had one on nutrient processing. I really like that. Overall, I like this heading system. It's easy to like track back to the original table. I think that'll make it a lot easier for the public to read. The only mm -hmm. one that was kind of uh, interested in changing was it used to be E. It was about plants preserving carbon um, in peat. Uh, where is it? It might be further up. Well, no, further. Further yeah. Yeah, okay, it's now number or letter I. Mm -hmm. uh, bordering vegetative wetlands store carbon within their life and preserve peat biomass uh, instead. I would put a period after biomass and strike the rest of it. I, I don't know, it just has a weird feeling of instead. We don't, we don't need to prove any cases here. We're not using an instead clause anywhere else, you know what I mean? I like that. 
remove this sentence you're saying, Leroy? Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Perfect. That was it on that section. Okay. Good, good, good. You guys are good. Okay. Okay, so definitions were made consistent here with the Wetland Protection Act. I would change is, vegetational, sorry. Vegetate, just vegetation. So that's a copy and paste from the Wetland Protection Act. Really? Okay, I've never ever seen that word before, but if, that, yep. if they say so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. That's okay. No, no, no. It's good. It's all good. Any comments you guys have, there's no, no bad comments here. Okay. So again, through E is Wetland Protection Act and then F, G are specific to our bylaw. Now, do you see the flow of this, how much better it is? Like to me, this is so much better because it's clear they have to meet everything in the Wetland Protection Act, but then we have additional requirements at the bottom. Um, um, all right, so presumptions, no change from existing. Those are all good. Performance standards, again, consistent with the Wetland Protection Act, except we're underlined. Um, okay, so under the Wetland Protection Act, it's one restoration, or I'm sorry, replication. So you guys understand the difference between replication and restoration, right? I could benefit from your- That's, please. <laughs> okay, so restoration would be taking an area that's been degraded and restoring it. So let's say you have a wetland that was historically filled and people want to remove the fill, reestablish wetland veg in it. That would be a restoration. Replication would be if the project is damaging wetlands, filling wetlands, altering wetlands, and to compensate for the loss of the wetland, that we are recreating a new wetland, redesigning ah, and constructing. Mitigation is the term that I but mitigation can cover both. Mitigation can cover restoration or replication, but okay. just to make sure that we're clear. So under state law, replication, if you're filling a wetland, you it's one-to-one. -one. So you're filling one square foot of wetland, you're um, replicating one square foot of wetland. Under our bylaw, it's doubled. So any wetland filling you do, you have to make it twice as big, the replication area. So that's just... One area where in these performance standards, our bylaw is different. So that's why I highlighted that. I think, Rochelle, for your benefit, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, a really yep. great example of that we got was where Eversource had to do some filling for utility work. And from that, we got a really great wetland up at Podic or on the line between Podic and Zol. So exactly. Plays out on the graph. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, from existing regulations, um, consistent with Wetland Protection Act. Um, okay, I'm going to keep rolling here, take it from existing regulations. So um, I'm just going to keep moving because this is all pretty, this is all pretty, it's, it's staying the same for the most part, it's just cleaning it up. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's not staying the same. I'll explain why in a second. Michelle, go ahead. Um, is it a fair assumption that when something is taken from the state bylaws, there's a citation or a reference, and when there's not, it is our bylaw, or is that not a consistent um, like theme? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so well, let me just show you something really quickly. Um, I'll come back down to where we're left off, but I just want to show you something really quickly because uh, these are all important things to discuss. At the top of this page is this. Um, okay. There's two of them actually, and I've got to 
clean this up with our town attorney so that it's correct, but um, all definitions, everything is presumed to be the same as the Wetland Protection Act, except where specified. But I do think it's important for us to restate the Wetland Protection Act requirements in here because um, if ever there is an appeal and they, let's say they don't meet something that's a state requirement, they could say, well, that's not listed in your bylaw as a requirement. And so if we have it listed in our bylaw, it's, it's consistent for both. So the appeal would go under our bylaw and under state law if they re were refusing or if they wanted to do something different. Um, but we'll clean this up. It's going to refer back to the Wetland Protection Act. There may be some, some of these subsections where there's references back to the Wetland Protection Act where we change that reference to reference back to our bylaw. And there's going to be some that continue to reference the Wetland Protection Act. It really depends. And we've got to, we've got to kind of scrub it at the end to make sure that that aligns, if that makes sense. On that point, Erin, did you say if someone ever files an appeal, it actually goes through two separate systems? And That's so, correct. Well, the real benefit of citing the wetland protection pieces that we really need directly in our bylaw, so it could be cross-referenced. Exactly, exactly. Because there are cases where there's an appeal and they just appeal under the Wetland Protection Act, but they don't appeal under our bylaw or vice versa. They just appeal under our bylaw and they don't appeal under the Wetlands Protection Act. It should be consistent tracks of appeal. So if they're, if they're appealing under wetland protection, they should be appealing under a bylaw at the same time. Gotcha. Unless they're, the only, the only thing that should be different is if they're only appealing something more strict under our bylaw that they disagree with or think is unfair. Okay, so let's come, it, Michelle, tell me, or did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm just trying to follow. I guess, like when you said, is it A and B down here that you were saying like at the, at the top of this page, these are, these are bylaw, um, we don't actually say, we don't actually give the qualifier that it's the bylaw, right? So I don't know, just as long as the other, as uh, if otherwise specified is consistent. Um, like, do we have to say under the bylaw, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I, you mean, I the, just, you mean the statements at the top of the page? The statement at the top of the page that it's, you know, unless otherwise specified, it's all consistent with the state wetlands. And then, but there are just sort of like these text paragraphs that are uh, more stringent under our bylaw. Mm -hmm. We don't specifically say that they are specific to the bylaw. That, that's oh, funny. I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, you know, maybe we want to do that. Maybe we want to say something yeah. like this. It would be helpful for like, so Leroy has a lot more experience than me. So I, I feel like I'm maybe more of like a public eye on this that doesn't use to reading it, but I mean, is there any downside to being super specific about I don't think so. No, I think that's a great point actually. Um, and I think that that could make it easier for people when they're reading this too, to understand which ones are different. I can go through and and just say bylaw only or something, or I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll ask the town, Council town attorney how to refer to those um yeah i mean if it works the way that it's written just i don't know it just seems mm -hmm. no i'm being right i think it's a good idea yeah yeah i think that's kind of a cool idea okay so let me explain something else that i did a pretty pretty substantive change here um so one of the things, again, trying to make this consistent with the Wetland Protection Act, one of the things I did not like about our bylaw regulations was it was like bordering vegetated wetlands and isolated vegetated wetlands were in one section together, broken out, like one was bordering and one was isolated. I didn't like that at all. And 
um, it's, I feel like it causes confusion <laughs> because the state only regulates bordering. And so here I'm making our bylaw consistent with the state regulations. I want to keep it just bordering in this section. Okay. And then what I did, I'll show you this, and, and there, we may need to do some edits to this section because it's, it's very confusing. Um, and I was sort of spitballing. I don't really know any other way to say this. Like I was kind of figuring this out as I go, how to make this better, um, work better. So here is the next section, which is isolated vegetated wetlands. And then what I tried to do here, because there wasn't very much reference to what was an isolated wetland, I tried to highlight or name any kind of isolated vegetated wetland that would exist in, in Amherst, like any possible one. Again, we can add more to that, but we had also sort of talked or brainstormed that we might separate out vernal pools from being an isolated wetland. And after a lot of thought and consideration, I'm not sure that that's the way to go. However, um, we can talk. We can talk about that more. If, if I have you no guys... problem. I mean, they're definitely an isolated veg wetland. They yeah. aren't always vegetated, however. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe with that comes down to definition. But let's let's have a look at this section, and we can talk about it some more. So, there was um, a Ralph Tyner paper in your um, research folder, which is where it was a, a paper that he wrote on isolated geographically isolated vegetated wetlands and that's where I took um, a lot of the information in the preamble from so that came directly from him and for the record Ralph Tyner is like a nationally recognized wetland expert who um, works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife and has for like 40 years he's um, He's written, he literally wrote the book on wetland wetland plant identification. So he is very, very um, uh, competent <laughs> to borrow uh, our preamble from in terms of um, uh, the significance of things. And we may want to, again, wordsmith that section more, but. Before we lose Michelle's last point about making it more approachable, if the state's not uh, covering isolated. Can we put one of those bylaw only tags right at the top heading for isolated vegetative? Wetlands? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I we let me let me highlight that. So it's it's a little we start to get in a little gray area with that only because so the Army Corps of Engineers does have jurisdiction over isolated vegetated wetlands. So if somebody wanted to fill a vernal pool, that would be Army Corps territory. But um, to your point, Leroy, we, we um, are empowered by the Wetland Protection Act regulations. And so that is not an Army Corps regulation. So I think it's, it's a fair comment to incorporate that totally. I did not know that. That's a, a um, whole level of protection. So then it's not bylaw only, it's Bylaw specific, maybe, or just bylaw. Like, yeah, um, yeah. I, well, I, I hear what you're saying on the bylaw thing, like that it's um, useful, and I, I think that that's a great idea. Um, and what we might do is do something like an asterisk or something on the bylaw only ones with like a yeah, footnote okay. that states. I like that. You know, something, like something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I just, before I forget, because you're scrolling down, you, you were talking about naming all of the types that could occur in Amherst. And just, I want to make sure that um, we use language here that isn't going to um, like restrict interpretation 
Yeah. So yeah. included, but not limited to is a good one to include, or like, for example, or a non-exhaustive list includes, but I just think whenever we're naming lots of species or, or plants or types of things that we shouldn't pigeonhole ourselves into like a strict list. Um, Cause that can get sticky in legal dealings. Wise point. <clears throat> I will make a point to include that under BVW as well. But yeah, I think that's a great, a great catch too. Okay, so <laughs> this is good. Um, all right, so definitions. Um, we, we're going to have to read through this many times. This section is going to be extremely important. And I made this an extremely strict section. I'll be completely straight up about that. I made it a very strict section. Um, so a couple points here, vernal pools are considered to be a type of isolated vegetated wetlands, not a subset of IVF, IVW, excuse me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and one, and these are just notes to myself, we have to check back on the definition section because we have a definition under the definition section that has to be consistent with this. So I wanna make sure we check back on that, which I didn't do. And then I also um, edited this section based on the Ralph Tyner paper as well. Um, so there's, there's multiple things referenced here. And so this is an, a section I wanna spend a little time on if you guys don't mind. Stop me at any time. And if anybody has anything they want to change or anything, please. So the first is A, just to say what is an isolated vegetated wetland. Um, surrounded by upland, has hydrophytic plant communities surrounded by terrestrial plant communities. Now, Michelle made a good point that vernal pools aren't always vegetated. So yeah, they're definitely not. I mean, like, if you go up on the power lines right now, there's tons, well, not yet, but there'll be tons of toads breeding in like dirt basins that have no vegetation, but if a stick falls in it, they can still attach eggs. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about how to, ex, you know, I mean, they're called isolated vegetation, vegetated wetlands, but not necessarily like, having, if, if a condition is to have plant communities and a forested wetland may not, and that's like a accepted mm -hmm. definition of a forest wetland that, you know, it might have two acidic soils to have any plant community. So just having some qualifier in there that it can account for that. I definitely would like to make sure that we're covering those kinds of wetlands. There we go. <laughs> um, the other thing is we can completely change the name. Um, I mean, so then may or may not have hydrophytic phytic plant communities. I've, so it still is insinuating that there might be plant communities. So I, I think may or may not be vegetated just like the, like just the example of a forest wetland. I don't know that you'd consider them vegetated because they're surrounded, they might be surrounded by well, like hemlock trees. Yeah, and, and I think to your point, Michelle, the, the way to approach this might be to just call this section, oh, sorry, I keep scrolling, just to call it isolated wetland. I was just thinking that, yeah. 
Effort just take out. Not, I didn't know if that was like a solid definition that we had to lean on, but that works. <laughs> I mean, the Wetland Protection Act does refer to isolated vegetated wetlands, and that's why I used that. Okay. But the Wetland Protection Act doesn't regulate them. So um, I think it's fair for us to use something different under our bylaw. Um, let me just make a note to myself here. Um, <clears throat> remove vegetated throughout. Okay. Let's just go with that for right now because I think that's the easiest way to go. So um, when we get down to definitions, I'll edit that. Do you, are you guys still okay with saying may or may not have? But for the vegetated hydro, um, uh, maybe a comma after vegetated. I think it just needs some more punctuation. And then comma after hydrophytic plant communities, after communities, comma. Oh, wait, is that working out? Or, okay. Wait, I think we just changed the whole thing. Okay, so may or may not be vegetated or have hydrophytic plant communities and is surrounded by terrestrial plant communities. I mean, should we do, should we do um, a semicolon instead? May or may not be vegetated. May have hydrophytic plant communities. I mean, sort of. Um, is that better? Yeah, so then the surrounded by terrestrial plant communities, like. I'm almost wondering if we can drop it. It's kind of inherent in the definition of isolated, but it. Yeah, because then what is surrounded, like what's that buffer? And then it gets, I don't know, is it necessary? Well, I, I want to hear what the full of what Leroy was about to say, because Michelle, you interrupted him. Go ahead, Leroy. No, not really. I'm just and and to the mine stream here is there would be a buffer in the soil line, you know. We could draw the line at hydric soils as opposed to where the plant community is. Yeah, that's a good question. Wondering if if vernal pools always have hydric soils. Good point. Let me, you know what, I'd like to ask, I'm going to make a note here to talk to, um, I want to ask somebody who specializes in this. Um, I'm just going to put a note here to myself. Um, and we can come back to that. I mostly just wanted to get something like a base. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> a basic definition going, but I, I see that there's already confusion about it. And so I think I need to talk to somebody who can give me a little more regulatory and, um, you know, uh, field-based science to substantiate what we're, what we're um, defining here. And I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that, okay? So this is the other thing. Another inconsistency in our bylaw regs was in one place it stated must be a minimum of 500 square feet. And in another location, it says has no minimum threshold size. I went with no minimum threshold size. Um, I mean, I think that 500 square feet is there to prevent people from saying like, oh, there's a puddle in my driveway and it's a vernal pool. Um, but I included that in here as no minimum threshold size. So that if there's something that the commission feels is a resource area and is isolated, that we're not restricted. Our, so, but okay, now I'm just worried that by saying that it doesn't have to be vegetated and there's no minimum size that we're allowing puddles to be isolated wetlands is that, have we gone overboard? Well, that is the, 
that is the question, you know? Um, I guess your specialist person might help yeah. us with defining. Okay. What, yeah. yeah, definitely check with specialists, but I'm also nervous about no minimum, I won't lie. Um, even a hundred square foot minimum puts you in 10 by 10 ponds, that would cover us for most everything we're thinking about, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, so the, yeah. I just, what if, I don't know, can this be uh, evaluated like on like ecological function and size? Like, well, so this isn't the only definition. There's a lot more definitions. So this is just one section of the definition. Um, so maybe it would help to go through. <laughs> Sorry. Was that? No, no. Um, no, it's, it's hard. It's questions for the specialist. Could we um, ascertain if the size is just the surface area we're looking at or if it's the network of pools? Because it's very rarely one single pool or isolated wetland. Yeah, good question. Um, well, <laughs> and I, can see red. I can see you read my definitions and my performance standards, Leroy. <laughs> I did. I thought mostly they were pretty good. But yeah, depths. That's good. Good, good, good. That is a that was that was one of them that I read that I really liked is that our ability to track their connections under the soil is protected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we good to keep moving? I don't want to um shortchange anybody's comments here. I think we just we have sort of a growing list of questions about how to define isolated wetlands and then mm -hmm. maybe just keeping track of them in your little comment box there and mm -hmm. and um, yeah okay I'm ready. Okay, so what I was trying to do here is be all encompassing. So they can be geographically isolated riparian wetlands that are associated with certain watersheds, so they might be connected subsurface to a river that's close by, but it's also isolated in that it doesn't have, it, it's surrounded by upland, right? Um, forming in basins, forming in, on flats, forming on slopes. They can form anywhere. Um, I don't wanna restrict and just say these are basins when they can form, you know, it could be a, a hillside seep here that we're talking about. Um, they can be artific artificially created ponds. People do this all the time. They create, they build a pond in their backyard. It turns into a resource area. All of a sudden you got frogs and stuff living in it. You've got a resource area. Um, and I, I think that later on we talk to make sure that we're not talking about stormwater here. If this was a intentionally constructed stormwater basin, that's not something we're going to take um, jurisdiction over unless the state does take jurisdiction over some stormwater um, systems that have over time converted to wetlands. Um, but there's there's like a timeline to that. Like it's 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 um, stormwater systems that are constructed after a certain date are stormwater systems, regardless of whether they turn into resource areas, because that's how they were designed. And if they if they fail, then it's going to cause damage. Um, to others, so it's important. Um, isolated veget this is an important one. Isolated vegetative wetlands can form as a result of fragmentation of the natural landscape by human development, like levee construction, road construction, urban development, agricultural drainage, altered river hydrology, controlled flooding by upstream dams, or river diversions. I see this all the time. There used to be a BVW, somebody put a road right through it, and then they're saying, oh, there's an ice, that's an isolated one on the other side. They cut off the hydraulic, the hydraulic connection, so it is isolated now, but it was done so by humans. I'm going to add suburban and urban, since that's like my neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Or just like, yeah, I don't know. Um, major shifts in river courses over time have left some what in the world, isolated vegetated wetlands on former floodplains that are no longer actively flooded. Isolated vegetated wetlands may occur in otherwise flat topography where water may pool at the surface once a year or may be contained in the top 24 inches of soil. 
may occur on the downhill or the downslope of a hillside seep. Uh, the presence of water stained leaves in a dry depression is an indicator of isolated wetlands. Uh, isolated wetlands may be delineated by any of the following criteria. So this is this is a section, um, and I, I specifically added in this statement, this criteria can be used to delineate the boundary of vernal pools as well as any other type of isolated wetland. I specifically added that language in there because we had a situation not too long ago where somebody said vernal pools are a subset of a seasonal wetland. They're not a seasonal wetland. And the argument was that this criteria couldn't be used to delineate them. So I wanted to make sure that it was clear that this criteria can be used. And used in containing the largest area being adopted for the delineation. And this was all taken from our previous bylaw, this whole section, or from our previous bylaw regulations, this whole section of these delineation. I just changed the added in the vernal pool element to make that clear. Woodland vernal pools are often seasonal ponds that are inundated during the wet season, usually from late fall to mid or late summer. Vernal pools may dry out every year or less often, thereby precluding the establishment of fish populations, making these pools extremely productive sites for amphibian reproduction. Species dependent on vernal pools for breeding, and then there's a list of species. <clears throat> okay. So, um, um, again, with the species list, maybe a may include, or do you have toad in there? Like, I don't know. I just want to protect the list from not necessarily being complete. And Where it says uh, include, you can just put included, but not limited to. Yeah. But you might want to add toad. Oh, great. Is that American toad? Michelle? Yeah. Yes. Yep. And you have newts. <laughs> uh, new. I don't. <laughs> Eye of a cat. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll see, I might seek the uh, specialist input on some of these yeah. as well um, of what to include. Okay. It can get tricky when you try to include everything. So I mean, I'm just amphibians is good. Right. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was just thinking that, like, do we even want to include species? I would, I probably wouldn't just because then uh, you're making more work for yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't see why can't you just include amphibians. There might be new ones or less of them, or I don't know. Yeah, if we're gonna keep the starting line species dependent on, we could put amphibians, we could also put invertebrates. Um, yeah. And obviously some plants. Uh, I'm a terrible speller, I apologize. Oh. Um. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll seek some some help on that with uh, get some get some in, insight from from some specialists on that. Okay. Do <laughs> you sec? Sorry. This. Okay. Presumptions. I'm just gonna read through this, you guys, because I think these are really important sections. Um, where proposed activity involves removing, filling, dredging, or otherwise altering an isolated wetland, the commission shall presume that such an area as well as the area within 100 feet of the mean annual boundary. I don't really like that mean boundary. I'm gonna say of the delineated boundary. 
um, of said wetland is significant to the interests of the preamble and in the case of vernal pools to the protection of wildlife habitat, particularly amphibian breeding habitat. That was taken from our existing regs. Isolated wetlands are presumed to be significant to the prevention of flooding, flood damage, protection of public and private water supplies, groundwater, and prevention of pollution. That was also taken from our current regs. Just before we go any further on that first one, A. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the case of vernal pools, if we are really trying to make that transition to vernal pools as a type instead of a subset, should we even have a line that states anything separately about vernal pools? You know what I mean? Should we maybe strike that line entirely? Because otherwise it almost reinforces the idea that vernal pools are a subset. Or... That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I mean... <laughs> I, vernal pools do protect wildlife habitat and amphibian breeding habitat, but so do other kinds of isolated wetlands. So I'm also wondering if we do. Okay, yeah, or another one for vernals. Yeah. Yeah. I hear where you're, what you're saying, though, Leroy. I think. I've, I've, I waffled back and forth constantly on this section. Do I pull vernal pools out of here? Do I keep it separate? Um, I think there's value in having them grouped together though, those types, even though they're very different types. Um, so let's, let's keep that in the back of our minds, but keep going. And if we, you know, if, if we want to reevaluate that, we can. Isolated vegetated wetlands are presumed to be significant. Okay, we already covered that. Um, pool breeding amphibian populations operate at multiple scales from the individual pool to surrounding upland habitat to clusters of pools in a given area or property. Conservation efforts limited to the protection of individual pools or even pools with associated upland habitat may be ineffective over the long term if connectivity among pools is not maintained. The commission can require habitat connectivity be maintained between clusters of pools and can consider development between pools habitat fragmentation that will have adverse impacts on wildlife habitat. That's a pretty dramatic, large change here. Um, but I also think an important one. One thought I had on this was some type of geographic differentiator, like saying, if there's a vernal pool within 500 feet or 1,000 feet of another vernal pool, it's considered to be connected, um, even within 400 feet. I mean, anything, because it's so open-ended that we could say like a pool in Michelle's neighborhood is connected to a pool in Leroy's neighborhood, and they might be on opposite sides of town, and we're not going to take jurisdiction over everything in between. That's not the intent of this. Yeah. Do we have a expert opinion that we can consult with like metapopulation and pools? There's a lot of work done on this at UMass. I assume um, they'd be willing to help. If you know some wetland people there, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But can I ask a question on this? I mean, so so the commission can consider this to have impacts on wildlife. That that is a resource that the commission is protective over. But does it, I mean, if it's not a water source, is there any teeth to it? Or is it just like in the broader consideration of impacts? Maybe that's a discussion I can have with you on another time. I'm just wondering, like, is this a like a holistic view that this is adding to, or, or is there any? I mean, the only concern I have with this is sort of an overreach, like a regulatory overreach view of it. Um, yeah. But I think anybody could say, let's say you have two vernal pools and they are 220 feet apart from one another. And you have a 100 foot no touch on one vernal pool and a 100 foot no touch on the other vernal pool and there's 20 foot span in between them. There's likely going to be um, 
meta populations, right, that are going from one pool to the other, coming back and forth. Um, I mean, so what we're saying here is like, and what, what we may want to say is like use proximity of buffers. So like if buffers between vernal pools is a certain amount, like less than a hundred feet, then we would consider the pools to be connected. And that might be something that would prevent that, you know, being thought of as, a, as an overreach. Um, yeah. I also have heard that migratory amphibians will go up to 400 feet or more from a vernal pool. Um, so, to like um, for estivation, I think. Yeah. So, I think yeah, it would be great to have some kind of quantitative guidance on it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's like it's it, there's a lot of value in like the education mm -hmm. aspect. I I just hope that it can be, I don't know, I, I have a similar concerns. So mm -hmm. however yeah. we want to like word it or provide some like citations, even um, for specific guidance. So Michelle, I'm going to make you a co-host really quick um, while we're doing this, just because I can't see if there's attendees from the public, like in case anybody like raises their hand, I can't see them when I'm sharing my screen. Okay. If you could just keep an eye on that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll get some. I'll get some insight on this section. I think that's a good. A good. Well, what is great? I do like the idea of using. I think it's a stronger idea to use the buffer zone proximity as opposed to a straight geographical um, pole. That's. Yeah, I think it's a stronger case. It gives us a lot of protection to start, so we can keep that connectivity number low. It would mm -hmm. work less, and it would be, a, I would assume, a stronger scientific case. Yeah. No, I think that's totally what I, you know, where I would be coming from on it to give us a, a sort of a more consistent um, something to point to. Um, so I just, uh, um, I added in some information here, um, just to make it clear that upland forest is very important to these resources. Um, if connectivity among vernal pools is interrupted, natural dispersal that enables recolonization, rescue efforts, and gene flow of species will be adversely impacted. Protecting individual pools without protecting adjacent upland habitat does little for even short-term persistence of populations of breeding amphibians. Woodlands surrounding vernal pools are significant to pride of had habitat for juveniles and adult salamanders. Forests surrounding vernal pools provide critical habitats for amphibian survival and are important for the, con for the conservation of biodiversity. Some of these are, I feel a little Redundant. Yeah, redundant. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that some some could be like eliminated or consolidated, uh, like the up the surrounding upland. Um, I don't. It, I don't know if now is the time to do it. But, yeah. Um, it's all and good stuff, is, but yeah, it seems yeah. like you could combine things, and the first paragraph sort of takes care of some of it too. Consolidate. Redundant sections. Okay. Filling and leveling drainage for agriculture, mining and excavation around isolated vegetative wetlands cause destruction of habitat, altered hydrology, groundwater withdrawals and drainage, water pollution runoff from developed areas and farmland, and direct discharge of contaminated water. Um, again, these are all taken from, you know, the, the paper. So this is all stuff that's pretty. What about, um, groundwater, oh, wait, groundwater withdrawals and drainage, groundwater pollution or no? Um, I mean, agricultural activities 
on a wetland could cert it seems to me like depending on soil types could affect like a residence nearby uh groundwater like sandy soils um i think it's there though no right yeah i, I mean that's yeah groundwater withdrawals well, it says contaminated water. So let me go back up to something, Michelle, that I think might um, get out what you're saying. Um, so this is in the preamble. Okay. If it's there, groundwater. Uh, isolated vegetative wetlands serve as recharge and discharge areas, contributing to both local groundwater flow and regional flow. Seasonal changes and functions may occur with some wetlands contributing to groundwater during high water periods. Okay, so I guess I'm seeing a lot of like recharge and levels of groundwater, but there isn't a connection between the groundwater and the pollution. That's that's the one that I was just going for. Like they seem to be okay. Let me take that. So water pollution. And all that good stuff. Uh, water pollution, e.g. runoff from developed areas and farmland, direct discharge of contaminants. Michelle, we can't hear you. Oh, maybe just add contaminated groundwater to that list of e.g.s underwater right pollution. Right here, yeah. this one? Yeah. Runoff from developed areas and farmland, direct discharge of contaminated water, and what was the, what, I'm sorry, could you just restate that? Um, polluted water you wanted to add? Um, groundwater contamination. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, so these are mostly taken from our existing regulations. Um, any proposed work within 100 feet of isolated wetlands shall not result in the following. Impairment of the capacity of the isolated wetland, as well as the area within 100 feet of the boundary of said wetland, or setback determined, by, determined to be appropriate by the Conservation Commission to protect said wetland to provide wildlife habitat. Do you see where I went with that? <laughs> So if the commission says there's two pools that are within 20 feet of each other and those are connected and we want them, we want the area in between them to be protected, that would give you that ability to do so. I know we want some kind of quantifiable number, but just that's there for that under performance standards. Flood damage due to filling uh, that causes lateral displacement of water, which would otherwise be confined within said area. An adverse impact of public or private water supply or groundwater supply, an adverse impact on capacity of said area to prevent pollution to groundwater, adverse effect on wildlife habitat in and around isolated wetland, an adverse effect on specified wildlife habitat or rare invertebrate species, vertebrate or invertebrate species as identified by procedures established in, that's the um, referring to natural heritage endangered species area. Is there a difference between E and G besides in and around? Or so one sort of bylaw and one's state reg. I'm sorry, which not which letters, Michelle? So There's e, no G. Oh, sorry, F. Um, he is yes, because, to because wildlife habitat is different from endangered species habitat from a regulatory standpoint. Okay. If it's an endangered species or a threatened species, then that has a different threshold. Okay, so F is specific to like um, natural heritage and state, got it. Right. All right, you guys good? Can I keep going? Uh, I was just wondering about B. I feel like we get a lot of pushback on this one from all sides, from neighbors, from developers. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is how solid is this? You said it's from our bylaw originally. Is this also backed up by the state? It seems like it would be, right? It's backed up by the Army Corps. All right, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so if somebody wanted to fill a vernal pool, they're in Army Corps territory, they would have to file a permit with the Army Corps of Engineers. 
Excellent. That was my question. Let me know. Okay, so I assume the Army Corps has definitions. Maybe that would be another place to look besides like the academic world, but um, good point. I would hope you know we'd probably want to maintain some consistency at Army Corps to at least know where we're not being consistent with them. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Very good idea. Okay. I think they might have rolled back some of those protections in the Trump administration. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Right. <laughs> just just yep. a note. Um, okay, so the other thing just to point out here, and um, this is another, um, so I have to double check this. So these are the sections I haven't done yet. Land underwater bodies, land subject to flooding, riverfront area. Riverfront area was not in here previously. It was not in our bylaw regulations previously. Yeah. It should be. Um, it has caused confusion, the fact that it's not. So it's, I added it in and uh, will be those sections. So right now I'm, I'm, I have a gap in the preamble for bank and I have a gap as far as these three sections. Anybody who wants to help me out with these is more than welcome to take a section. Um, no, I'm particularly the preamble because it requires quite a bit of research um, to get it right. Um, I've contemplated uh, so this is the other thing that's a little tricky, like isolated land subject to flooding and bordering land subject to flooding. Um, they can also be broken out, but I kind of feel like that's also kind of redundant for us to be doing and that for land subject to flooding, keeping them consolidated, we haven't had a problem with that up until now. So it's like, if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, I think the wetland issue has been an issue, so... Uh, I'm with you on that one, Eric. If you do want some help, I'm going to take a crack at preamble for section D there, land underwater, or at least crack at doing some of the research. You, you can write it. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I can send you the list of interests, and if you want to, I would love to have some help with that. Leroy, that'd be awesome. Oh, we're just sticking with the same interests, right? The same, whatever it is, 11, 13. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to compile a list um, that's again specific to our bylaw because our interests are different and we can't we can't say we have additional interests and then not outline what why our interests are significant to the resource area. It's just an important part of the regs. Thank you, Larry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ready, ready to move on to buffer zones. Um, so if uh, what I'd like to do, so a lot of the buffer zone stuff is staying exactly the same. And I'd like to come back to this C that's highlighted in a moment. Um, but before we go there, most of this, like I said, is exactly the same, has not changed. This is Aaron's edits to minimum setbacks for various types of projects. Now, multiple changes here. I took out the separate for solar panels because I, I don't really understand why that was separated out. Um, to me, that's commercial. That's a commercial project or um, a utility project. Um, it's not, you know, we're not calling out electrical projects or sewer projects or um, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something else, but we're not calling those out specifically. So I don't, I don't really like the idea of having that listed separately. Um, I made the no work distance 50 feet. And this is um, not really meant to, I mean, I, I, I went back and forth between calling this recommended minimum setbacks because there was no header on here at all. 
And so it's not clear, are these required setbacks? Are these suggested setbacks? Are these optional setbacks? You know, um, at the bottom it says, it said previously that um, it was fairly easy to just ask the commission to override these. Um, you know, that the, the commission had the authority to just override these. In this case, what I said was the commission reserves the right to adjust these case setbacks on a case-by-case -case basis in consideration of hydrologic connectivity, habitat connectivity, slope, protection of the interests listed in the bylaw and regulation. If the commission determines this a setback is insufficient to protect the interests in the Amherst wetland bylaw, it can require greater no work distances from resource areas and building setback distances from resource areas. And I felt that was a really important one, particularly because of a recent project, which we dealt with, which there was a steep slope right next to a wetland. And the argument was made, you guys allow clearing up to the 35 feet all the time, which isn't true, by the way, the commission has been pretty, pretty resistant to that. But there was a steep slope, which is a, to you know, a topographic difference between many projects that we deal with. And so talking about slope the same as we talk about a flat piece of property, I feel like is a real problem. Um, and then... Um, is that chart now consistent? As in, is there anywhere else now in the bylaw where it does still say 35 foot and we have 50 on the chart? For no work. Well, so it's now consistent with the bank section where it already stated that um, there was no work allowed within 50 feet. So the bank section is a section where um, that was already in our regs. Um, we do have specified in another section, which is like our guidance on permit filings, that if you're within 50 feet, you need a notice of intent. If you're over 50 feet away, you can file a request for determination, depending on project, of course. Um, this is me throwing it out there for protection of the wetlands, <laughs> because you know, I think that there was a lot, we've had a lot of questions come up in the course of this discussion of, um, you know, if there are cases where work within 100 feet of wetland might impact it adversely. And where are we drawing that line? I'm not, you guys, if you think this is unreasonable, I am totally open to discussion. Um, I'm recalling when we first visited this table, you presented some numbers from other towns and they were almost all greater than Amherst. Is that, do I remember that correctly? Yeah, so South Hadley is a 50 foot no disturb. Um, Northampton has a hundred foot no disturb except in certain zoning districts. So like, for example, in like a downtown zoning district or like a densely developed zoning district, they will allow, I think up to 15 feet. Um, and so, yeah, they're much, they, they do extend a much stronger um, no disturb zone than Amherst does, where it definitely felt like looking at other regulations, like, gee, we're, we're giving away the farm here. Um, but I do want to just jump back up here for a quick second, because this is an additional. The commission may allow alteration of up to 20% of the area within 50 foot to 100 foot buffer zone. This is a total cumulative allowance for lots created prior to the inception of these bylaw regulations. Um, and I don't know if I like that. I, we might just say, wanna say total cumulative allowance. Um, the proposed work must have no significant adverse impact on the resource area and the applicant must provide evidence deemed sufficient by the commission that the area being disturbed will not harm the resource area values protected by this bylaw. This is taken from Northampton. And I really liked this because just because we say 
you can alter up to right now 35 feet no disturb doesn't mean you should be leveling that area and removing every tree and so you can be that close but you can't alter the whole thing on the entire extent of the property yeah i see the point there i like that um there's if we allow i don't know if that's actually a variance but if we allow that there's certainly like different levels of developing that would have different levels of impact and i just like the way that's written i guess and also like it adds some quantitative measure with the, with the total cumulative allowance, which is good guidance, I think, for the project proponent and the commission. I'm leaning towards removing that one statement there created prior to the inception of these regulations. Um, it's like a grandfather rule, or is that the point of that? Yeah, because it's only saying that you we would only allow that 20% if the lot was created before the inception of the bylaw, which I don't think is fair. Um, I think it should be for all lots. Anyway, so those are changes I made. Those are changes I made to this buffer zone um, section. And I think as long as we're protecting wetlands, I'd like to see more protection. I recently, um, I've been monitoring a project which was permitted, actually it's the U Drive South project, which is right across from Big Y um, and Dunkin' Donuts and Ginger Garden and um, there's a veterinary clinic across from it too. It's on the corner. And I mean, I think that that site is not a bad site for what was proposed there because I think that that wetland was already pretty severely degraded as a result of Route 9 runoff and stuff. But it's very difficult for me to go out there and see um, a parking lot within 25 feet of a wetland boundary. I, there is direct discharge coming off of that parking lot within 20 feet, uh, 20, 23 feet of the wetland. And I just feel like that's, that's definitely going to impact it over the long term. Um, I mean, I think that they, that's a good project and I'm not dissing that project on any level. I think that it was a really well done, well engineered project. And I think they've, they've monitored it. They've, you know, prevented any violations out there. It's more so like the proximity issue. It's like a gut check, like, wow, that's very close. And anybody can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I support these changes. And I think that the previous numbers weren't insufficient to adequately protect water resources and like ecological functions. And you've seen it firsthand. So I also trust that you've watched like the life cycle of a project and a wetland and you have experience with that. And I think that these numbers are actually still a compromise between protecting the resources and allowing for development. Like, I think that they're quite a compromise. Like I, I don't think our, I don't think we're putting wetlands first with a 50 foot buffer. That's still a, a not that much space in my opinion, so. I'm not pushing back on that change, but I'm interested to hear Leroy's opinion. If you have uh, one or want to share. Very well stated. I would second almost everything you said there. I'm definitely down to increase all these to 50 feet. And I think uh, we would be well within our rights to go further, but 50 is, I think, what's going to make everyone quite happy. My big holdup, and it's actually because of something you said about Northampton, Aaron. Usually they have uh, variances for downtown and wherever that come into 15 feet. Does Amherst have some sort of um, building zoning code for that in our tiny bit of urban areas? Because that would be my concern. If we just keep increasing distances, we're going to have nowhere downtown that's buildable. I'm thinking like the, what was it? Um, the Tambrook went under the old Batucci's lot? Mm -hmm. I think you make an incredibly good point here, Leroy, which is, there should be 
exceptions to this, and we may want to spell those out. Um, I'm just taking I like, notes. Yeah, I really like, I'm glad you brought that up because I like that Northampton does that. And actually just my understanding of like the sort of direction of zoning and development in Amherst, that would actually be sort of consistent with the visions of the planning department, you know, of allowing for the development of downtown. Um, I mean, I, I don't keep up with it that much, but it seems wise to make it more specific to the zoning in Amherst, but I don't even, that seems kind of like a big project. Well, let's have a look at it really quick, um, the zoning, because I mean, I, like I've been trying to keep zoning separate from conservation as much as possible, but I also recognize that there may be situations where that makes sense. Um, so we have like the educational, um, and again, I mean, within the colleges, the developed landscape is very different than surrounding Amherst landscape, much more urbanized, I would argue, in, say, the educational um, ED district. So that's one we might consider. Um, there's also general yeah. business districts. This, um, I can't, maybe I can move. So, okay, here we go. Um, so the general bis business districts are the, the um, uh, let's see. There's a hash commercial. Um, so uh, no, hold on one second, sorry. You just go up a little bit. It's I can't annotate while I'm so there's there's multiple here. Um, and I'm not sure that it's going to be apples to apples with Northampton because it seems like there's like so for example, outlying residents, low density residents, um, you know, those those are ones obviously where we'd want to keep those um setbacks strong. Um there's but there's a lot of like I wouldn't say like Cushman, for example, I wouldn't want to be one of those areas because I feel like Cushman is a very residential location. It's not really like a meant to be a developed area. Um, professional so that, research park is an area that's designated and that's very, you know, you've got Eastman Brook running right through it and it's a lot of it's very pristine, undeveloped. Um, uh, light industrial, there's, um, that's like, probably like um, the sawmill and uh, there's, you know, the, the areas that are just north of the Mill River in North Amherst. Light industrial, educational, and then, you know, you get general business, limited business, et cetera. So it sounds like we, if we want to go about this, we would have to make a different rule for each one of these zones, or we'd have to look at them each in, in any way. We might have similar rules for mm -hmm. groups of them. I, I, that seems like a, a big job, uh, but, but, but I also think like it's worth considering or like, I don't know, having some guidance for the commission or like statement for the commission to be able to consider zoning as part of this, like, cause you know, if we're, if we're reviewing like that Bertucci's parking lot, right? So I assume that that buffer, we made some exceptions with it which we probably wouldn't do in um, a very rural area, a pristine area. So on what the basis on which we're doing it is zoning and condition of the current landscape and infrastructure. Yeah, it's but, like grandfathering. Like, it's grandfathered because it was right now that's developed. like a 
totally subjective. Is it grant? But it, right now we're just doing that subjectively. And then someone could say, well, you did it for Bertucci's. Why can't you do it? For well, like no, no, I don't think so, Michelle, because that was already paved up to that point. There was no encroachment closer to the stream. They were just repaving an existing parking lot. So, okay, it's, so maybe it's, that's not a good example. Yeah. I guess my point is more that like if we think it's important to consider zoning, maybe we should continue this conversation and make it a basis on which the commission is, you know, has grounds to consider that buffer. It's because it's not apples to apples with the zoning. Like, I, you know, I don't know. I haven't thought that out very much, but it, um, right now we're supposed to be considering it all on the same plane, right? But it, but it isn't. Um, anyway, I don't have more to add to that right now, but it, it's an interesting consideration. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm in agreement. And like, I would, I would say, um, uh, like the general business district of downtown Amherst, where it's already developed, um, it would almost be a no brainer. Um, but there's other areas like at UMass where there's, you know, some places which are green space and, you know, you wouldn't want this to be, to put a blanket over that area and say, yeah, you can get within 15 feet in these areas. Like, like Campus Pond being a good example, like it's already an extremely degraded stream system being the Tan Brook. There's already built infrastructure around the entire thing and most of it is running subsurface in culverts. And so, you know, yeah, are we using this as an excuse to get closer and degrade already degraded resources even more? Yeah. Well, I guess there's enough leeway for the commission to consider case by case basis for this to, to happen. So maybe Northampton just is big enough and there's more going on there that they decided a different approach. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's something I think we can think about more. I would ask you guys to think about it more. I'll think about it more. Um, like I said, I've got um, multiple more sections to draft. I've got, um, let me get back to this for a second. Um, I still have, um, you know, the land underwater, um, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, And the riverfront, which is basically just going to be copied and pasted from Wetland Protection Act stuff, with the exception of the preamble, of course. Um, but those three sections still need to be drafted. And then um, we have the preamble for bank that needs to be done. So other than that, we are um, we're getting really close. Um, while we have 10 minutes, I just want to mention I was contemplating being away on the 22nd. Michelle, you said you were okay with moving our last meeting to the 29th. I am, yep. Leroy, are you comfortable with that? I think so. I'm looking around right now for a calendar. It's just the following Friday, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. And how would you guys feel about doing another two hour session? <laughs> so, we, is this? Did we accomplish what we wanted to today? We did. We did. And we've only got we've only got really three more resource areas to review. I don't expect those to be a deviation to the degree that the previous ones were. Um, so I don't really expect we're going to have to go through those with the same fine tooth comb that we did on the, these. I think a lot of it's going to be taken from the previous regulations and from Wetland Protection Act, and that's basically going to be it besides the preambles, um, which are specific to our bylaw regs or for our bylaw interests. Um, but I think we have enough things like that we need to revisit from this section where I need to do some follow-up and come up with some recommendations to 
um, uh, bridge the <laughs> divide sort of of like, how are we going to handle these situations that I need a little more, I would, a little more time would be helpful. And also I think if we have a longer session, we might need to a little more time to review those. I'm actually planning to do a special meeting the following week with CONCOM to like hold a hearing to review this stuff. So I'm hoping that we would be able to cover everything in two hours. If you guys can, can do it. I can do it. Um, and if we're done earlier, that's great too. Right. Um, I can definitely do the two hour meeting. I am also, I saw your email about the special CONCOM meeting. Uh -huh. that, that special meeting itself, the first one I'd be available for. Um, concern the second one, which is a normal meeting, but the one where you want to have comments from the whole commission. Uh -huh. yeah, it's possible that I might have to not be there. Okay, and that's completely fine, Leroy. I mean, whatever, and you can always send me comments just to me and I can share those too. Um, if you have to miss a specific meeting. Um, okay. And Leroy, uh, I am sending you for land underwater. You wanted to assist with the preamble, right? Yes, please. All right, great. Um, any other comments? folks want to make today on this? I don't know. We started late. We got it early. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I have to. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any other comments. Okay. All right, guys. Well, oh, thank you so oh, much. This will be quick. So I just, I want to um, thank <laughs> Roy and you. What? Wait, did you have something to say? I just want to say quickly, I don't think we actually formally reviewed sections five and six, but it's just conclusion, but I saw no problems with this. Because I know last time I had not looked over five or six at all. But Oh, five and six of the, um, of the regulations you haven't looked at? It, yeah, mm -hmm. six is conclusion and then five is right before there, I forget. Okay. Uh, Okay, so that's good that we have a two hour session next time. I'm so we'll try to get through as many comments as we can at the next two hour session. What we don't get through, I think I'm just going to take what we have, get it as close as I can, highlight outstanding questions or changes that we might want to make to certain sections, and then just take it to the full board, try to power through it. I mean, I don't know what else we can do at this point because we're coming up against the end of April. Um, but if you also have comments on those sections and you want to send me edits, please, by all means, um, just make sure you just send them to me and I'm happy to incorporate things. Did you send and Michelle, us those? Do we have those? They should be in the OneDrive. Okay. Michelle, you were going to say something too. Oh, I was just going to close the meeting, but before that, I realized that we didn't open the meeting. Um, <laughs> well, acknowledging we didn't open the meeting, I would say that it started at uh, recording. And so um, now we're, I'm not sure exactly what time that was due to technical difficulties, but we can close the meeting at 1.54. Did I get my time right? You got it. Um, got it. April 1st. <laughs> Thank you, Leroy. Thank you, Aaron. Thank I'll you. see you guys next week. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.